just pray with me before we start up though. Um, God, we thank you for uh, just a time to hear your word. We just ask that you would bless our time together. Uh, let it be your word that your people hear through my voice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Again, I mean, you heard the reading. We're in Judges 7. This is just an interesting story, and it really is kind of a bummer that one of my friends came, because she's the one who told the story to me, and now I have to really do it justice, so <clears throat> pray for me on that. But we have Gideon, and he is commanding this army, and they're going up against the Midianites. And we're starting off with about uh, 32,000 people. And that's, it's a good, healthy, comfortable number to go into battle with. But God speaks and says, uh, Gideon, you've got too many people with you. Because if you go in with this many, you know, some people are going to think that it was the big army that got the victory. They won't really give me the glory. So we're going to cut it down some. Gideon, okay. So God says, make an announcement. Whoever is fearful and trembling, you may return home. And you may have to make some announcements in your life, you know, get some people from around you if they're fearful and trembling. But um, that only left us with 10,000. We lost a lot of people when the scared people went home. Um, so Gideon, he's thinking, and this isn't written, this is my interpretation. Gideon's thinking, okay, great, 10,000, I'm still I'm comfortable with that. I'm trusting you, Lord, let's go in. So uh, God says, no, still too many, 10,000 is not going to cut it, um, not giving me a good vibe. Let's cut it down some more. So he says, take them to the river, and I'll test them there, and whoever I say can go, they can go. Whoever I say can't go, they can't go. Got it. It's done. We're going to the river. So they get down there, and God says, let me paint the picture how I see it. Whoever, um, whoever takes the water in their hands and drinks you know, up to their mouth, uh, separate them out, and then there's another group, whoever gets down on their knees and just drinks with their face in the water, put them in another group. And Gideon's like, great. So he sees the two different groups and all these people down on the ground. He's like, oh, great, I get to keep these people and these few, you know, they can go home. No, it's actually the opposite. That leaves us with 300 people. 300 people. Why does it matter, though, how we drink? Why does it matter whether or not I take the water and put it in my face or if I, if I kneel down and just put my face in the water? Well, I've got a dream of my own I'd like to interpret about putting your face in things. A few years ago, um, <laughs> not literally, no, not literally. Okay, so a few years ago, my car, uh, one of my car doors, I'm, this is a dream now, one of my car doors, uh, it won't lock anymore. That part is real. That's the only part that's real. So <clears throat> I have to go to my ministry partner's apartment to speak with him about some things. And I get there, and I've got all this stuff in my car because I live in my car. I mean, laptop, textbooks, everything that costs money, I've got it in my car, including my wallet. So I get in the house, we talk, and what was supposed to be a few minutes, because I'm knowing that I have a broken door and that my car can't be secured. What's well, supposed to take a few minutes turns out to be like five hours. And now it's nighttime, and now I come flying out of the house because something snaps in my head. You know, your door doesn't work. So something snaps in me. I run out of the house, and you know, in your dreams, you're an athlete. So I'm leaping over bushes. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm jumping fences and all this stuff. And I finally get to my car, and my car is still there. That was my number one worry. I'm thinking, Lord, my car is gone. But it's not. The car is there. I sigh. Deep breath, relief. Okay. But then I get closer to it, and I realize that that door that doesn't lock is just slightly ajar, just open enough to, not, to let me know that my property's not damaged, but somebody has touched it. So I open the car, you know, frantic about my laptop and my books and all this stuff, look for that. It's all there, untouched. Everything just as junky as it was when I went in the house. And then I think, Lord, look for your wallet, because that's where all the money is. So I look, my wallet's still there, everything, um, except my driver's license. They get in my car, they see everything. This is a dream, but God help us. They see my laptop, my textbooks, everything that I have value on in my mind, and they leave it untouched. But my driver's license is the only thing they take. 
They can't sell it, but it identifies me, doesn't it? My whole identity, my, me, that's what they take. See, I had my face in the conversation that I was in. I had my face in my own agenda, so I left what really had value in my life unattended. I left it unattended for anybody to touch. So I get the whole drinking thing, and then Gideon, <clears throat> he has to move forward with what looks like nothing. And then uh, verse 7, God says, with the 300 men who've lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hand. Let everybody else go to their home. You know, at this point, you don't even want to pray. You're scared to pray because every time God opens God's mouth, something gets snatched from under you. I'm tired. Of, I'm not going to pray. I don't have nothing left to pray. But at this point, what can you do? Because you don't have a plan. And you're down to 300. And the Bible said they're like locusts. You can't count locusts. You can count 300 in your head. So you're in trouble. But he goes on and um, says he took provision, or the people took the provisions in their hand and their trumpets. So we've got 300 people, a few swords, and some trumpets. Fantastic. <laughs> Fantastic. <clears throat> I'm just telling you what the scripture says. Same night, though, same night, and we've already, we've already established we're not comfortable talking to the Lord anymore, but the same day, and it has been a long day, God speaks again and says, uh, go down against the Midian camp. I've already given it to you. It's already promised. You've already, you won. And uh, if you're scared, though, you can go ahead and take your servant pure with you down to the camp, and you're going to hear some things, and what you hear is going to strengthen your hands. This is where, excuse me, this is where it gets real interesting, because um, you go down to the camp, and you can't help but to notice how many people there are. I mean, I'm just, I'm imagining, because it's not really written now, but I'm just imagining he and his servant peering through the cracks of, you know, the camp and seeing all these thousands. And whoever wrote this has a pretty good sense of humor. Let's see, it said, they lay along the valley like locusts in abundance, and their camels were without number as the sand on the seashore. But you can see this. You tell me I get down here, my hands are going to be strengthened, and then you show me a swarm? How am I supposed to be strengthened by that? Well, he goes, and uh, again, no plan, but he listens. And they get down there, and uh, he does, in fact, hear something, a dream, actually. <clears throat> One of the guys is saying, you know, I had this dream. I dreamed that a loaf of barley bread rolled down to our camp and hit the tent in such a way that it flipped upside down and fell flat. Now, again, think about how our prayer life has been so far as Gideon. So Gideon says, and again, it's not written. This is just me. God, I've had enough of the riddles, really. I don't understand. How is a story about a loaf of barley and a tent supposed to help me right now? But <clears throat> you got to understand something about barley. I'm, I'm not really a, a health food person, so I don't know what barley looks like. I don't know where to buy it, but I know... I know that in the Bible, <laughs> everything means something. We don't understand it because we're in a different context, but everything means something. So barley, I look it up, and, you know, the first person we go to is Google. <clears throat> and I Google it. It turns out Oprah's got it on her website as the number three superfood, and it is packed with fiber and vitamin B and E. That was good for me, but they didn't probably know that. So I'm thinking, what is the spiritual significance? Keep looking, keep researching. Turns out, anytime you see barley um, in the Bible, it, it, it's representing a type of virtue. Barley was a simple grain, like wheat, you know. It grew in the field, and it was cheap, and it matured fast. So to them, it represented the truth and simple goodness. So anytime you see barley, you know that they're celebrating truth. They're celebrating simple goodness. They're celebrating that harvest that is real to them. And I'm thinking, boy, that made that story make a whole lot of sense, didn't it? See, Gideon, although he's uh, probably a bit confused right now, his army's been reduced down to the truth of simple goodness. So we had to get rid of the people who were afraid. We had to get rid of the people who wouldn't give God glory. I'm thinking, you know, God could have left Gideon with, with all those people, but that wouldn't have been simple. 
and then he could have left the people that were unaware and put their face in the water. That wouldn't have been good. And then he could have left people or left Gideon with people whose heart, you know, wasn't prepared to give God glory. And, and that just wouldn't have been the truth. So Gideon, down to the truth of simple goodness. See, these people in the dream, they understood that it wasn't about a loaf of bread hitting a tent. It was about something small and true and sincere and good, tearing down everything that they found safety in, tearing down everything that they found power in, that they had their belief in. Um, but there's, there's something else, though. It, it's the, the tent. I don't want you to think like a camping trip tent. I don't want you to think about one of those things you pull out and blow up, and then you can just kind of pitch it in the campground. I want you to think big top circus, a revival, or something like that. You know, a sturdy tent that can hold thousands of people and weapons. And all. Think a structure. Think about a structure. And I, I ask the Lord, you know, what, <clears throat> what's the difference between uh, a loaf of bread and a tent? Now, that sounds kind of a dumb question to ask the Lord, but I've got to get clarity. And so I asked God, and uh, God said, well, you know, just think about it for a minute before you start asking me questions. So I do. All right, loaf of bread, tent. All right, one is uh, probably round or one is brown. You know, all this stuff that I'm throwing out. <laughs> you can't eat a tent, God. And I'm thinking that's the answer. And I keep throwing stuff out. God's like, girl, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> the difference <laughs> between a tent and a loaf of barley bread is that a tent won't roll. And I'm like, what? Leah, listen, this is God talking. Listen. <laughs> We're talking about a loaf of bread hitting a tent in such a way that it turns upside down and falls flat. Will a tent roll? No, God. But I had to sit in quiet with it because it didn't really sit in. I get it now. See, a tent is a structure. And you and I, we have structured our lives in such a way that they won't roll. They won't move. We built up things. We built up plans, jobs, career, all kind of stuff we have built up and pitched and, and solidified into the ground so that they won't move. And then we wonder why it's so hard to follow the Holy Spirit. We wonder why we can't make it into our destiny. We wonder why we feel so stagnant. Well, you, you built a stagnant home, and people live in the houses they build. It's an, it's an unfortunate truth. And then um, the thing is, though, we like, to, we like to think we're Gideon, though. We like to think that we are a little ball of truth rolling down to minister to the whole world. But sometimes we are the people in the tent. Sometimes it's us that may have to dream about something destroying us. I don't know if it's a bad thing. Maybe a scary thing. But I don't know how bad it really is. But there, there's got to be something else about this story. Let me read the, the verses after the dream. It says, Behold, I dreamed a dream. The cake of barley bread tumbled into the camp of Midian, came <clears throat> and struck the tent so that it fell and turned upside down so that it lay flat. His comrade answered, This is no other than the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. God has given into his hand <clears throat> Midian in all the camp. So the dream's interpreted, he understands they're not going to win. But what does that have to do with us? Because we're not in battle. We're not, we're not outnumbered by some army. What, what does that have to do with us? Well, I'll tell you, we live <clears throat> in a fact-based society. We do. We like quantitative data, uh, spreadsheets, charts, how much, how many, can we count it, can you report the count? If you can't report the count, then the count doesn't count. That's the world we live in. So believers, we have to get very serious in, in this time about being able to tell the difference between a fact and a truth. See, Gideon sees fact. He was put in position to see facts, to peer through this gate and see the facts. You, sir, are outnumbered. That's a fact. The truth, numbers don't really matter so much. If God says you get it, you get it. That's the truth. But the, the, the thing I love about it, though, is um, just talking about facts. If you remember the story of Jesus and the 5,000, you know, Jesus is here ministering, and he's got uh, his disciples with him, and they're in front of 5,000 
you know, this, this big crowd, and they've, they've got to preach. But the people are hungry. And, you know, people won't listen to you talk if they're hungry. That's just, they're just not. So Jesus understands that, that logic, and we have to feed the people. And the disciples start looking around, you know, we, we don't have the money. To, if, if, we bought pe- if we bought enough food for this many people, you know, they'd only get a bite. It's just not enough. So, Lord, what do we do? And then Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, I think, comes strolling up. And he's like, we got this boy over here, and he's got this lunch kit, and it's got two fish and what? Five barley loaves. I did not know this. You know, you get the Bible school version, two fish, five loaves, because nobody cares it's barley, but it matters now. So he gives, we got this kid, he's got two fish and five barley loaves. Facts. Two fish, five little round loaves of bread are not going to feed 5,000. That is a fact. Okay? The truth, though, we know it because we weren't there. We've read it later. But the truth is that there were leftovers. There were leftovers. The truth, though, is that when you're dealing with Jesus, he has enough living water inside of him to keep you and sustain you for your whole life. Jesus has enough salvation inside of him for this entire world. That's, that's truth that we're talking about. You know, fact, uh, he died. They killed him. They crucified him. <laughs> the truth, though, he's simply risen. That is the simple, good truth. Now, my question to you would be, if you believe that kind of truth, why is it so hard for us to believe our dreams? Why is it so hard for us to believe the truth that comes from our dreams, whether it be when we're asleep? Because I don't, I don't think a dream has to be, you know, when you're asleep or if you're in a trance. Or I think a dream is just anything that can take you out of the reality that you're living in or that you're believing or whatever you're seeing with these eyes and just speak a truth to you, just give you a word. Why do you believe Jesus got up and saves if you can't even believe that you're going to have a job one day? I, I don't see the... It's confusion to me. I don't understand why we would believe something so major, and then when God speaks a word of life on our lives, we're ready to go back to sleep. We don't want to live out that dream. Just some facts to throw out, because I feel like we've spent enough time together now for me to throw out some facts. So many people... You know, they suffer from depression and all these things. And, it's, you know, it's real. We can prove it. People are in therapy and all this. I think that's great that we have therapy. But the truth in that is that you and I and them are loved by God. That is the truth. Um, you know, facts. Gosh, so many facts in the kingdom. <clears throat> We're scared. We're scared of future, we're scared of praise, we're scared of losing, you know, all that we have. But truth, you got promised eternity. These kinds of things that we really struggle with, fact and truth. And and what I love is, um, in the end of it, it says that Gideon, it wasn't up there, but 15. Gideon says, when he heard the dream and its interpretation, he immediately worshipped. I bet you were wondering what those trumpets were for. Because that sounded dumb. That sounded, we're outnumbered, and we, we need to, to get as much room as we can for stores. Well, we don't have time for instruments. But you do, though, because I, I guarantee you there's going to be a time in your life when some dream is going to come to pass, and you're going to need something to help you worship. That time is coming. It's coming sooner than you think. I believe this. And I also believe, since we're talking about resurrection and truth and all, I believe that in the last day there will be a trumpet blown, and I believe that the people who love God will worship God. So are you going to be in that? Are you going to be in that dream? Or are you going to be in facts? Just, just a few questions I wanted to pose. I really didn't want to take up much of your time. That's actually all that I wanted to say. But I pray right now that um, when we worship together, you think about truth and the way that you've built your life and the way that you built your prayer life. Because, you know, you can build your prayers in such a way that you've made up your mind before you pray which means that you're actually talking to you and not God. <laughs> yeah, that kind of stuff, when the truth hits it, goes upside down and it falls flat. That's my prayer for you tonight. So I pray that those things come to pass as we worship. Um, God bless you. God keep you. Um, may dreams surround us and may love be inside us. Uh, in Jesus' name, thanks be to God. See, I can't you with these arms that hold me back against this wall. Release me from these.
chains that hold me fast You see there's a light at the end that I'm running to If you hold my hand then I'll show you There's a lot more waiting for us all at the end of the road